Welcome to Open Frame, a podcast by Pixiesat, the place for photographers and other creatives to have inspiring, honest, and uplifting conversations. All right, hello everyone. My name is Bonicia Carswell. I am a photographer, educator, and lover of dance on a mission to help others live more fulfilling lives. I'm excited to chat and learn with our guest, Henry Danner, who's a New York City-based visual storyteller with a heart for fostering community, influencing change, and sharing stories that heal. So welcome, Henry. Um, Tell us a little bit more about you. Well, first and foremost, thank you, uh, Venetia, for doing this and, you know, for having me on. This is, I want to say, my first official podcast, like, (laughs) so that's dope. Um, and <clears throat> as far as a little bit about myself, I feel like, you know, you gave a nice elevator pitch that I feel like kind of sums up who I am in all aspects of my life. You know, I'm somebody that, you know, professionally, I'm in the field of social work and I've been doing that for over a decade. And what draws me to visual storytelling is really um, what I think is the ability of photos to have healing power and to also like record important moments um, in history um, that tell a story that I think will impact future generations. So, you know, a, a lot of my personality traits, um, as far as like being intuitive, being really into history, um, really all kind of coalesce you know into like what I've done throughout my career as a social worker and now also as a visual storyteller just like trying to um, document you know people places and things that I think are really going to be important to the future generation. Lovely I think that's so interesting I find that a lot of photographers that I know they have like a unique background that kind of influences or shapes the visual work that they do. Um, I'm curious, like how long have you been in the field of social work? Um, so 2012, so about 10 years, right, is when I started my first gig, like professional, you know, but I would say like, if I really wanted to be technical, I would go back to when I was 17, because that's when I first started working with kids, you know, like summer camp type of things. But to me, that was still like social work because it was still getting involved, like and learning about um, these children and caring for them and things like that. So all things that social workers do, um, but have different professional tools in the toolbox to do that. So I I just kind of feel like it was always like just a part of me, part of my personality and, um, you know, just who I was. So yeah, I would say even, you know, 17 years old. And I'm not going to say what year that was because I don't want nobody <laughs> adding, doing a little quick math. <laughs> no problem. Thank you for that insight. So would you say um, that your work as a social worker shapes your photography work or like what other experience have also, experiences have also shaped your work? Um, it absolutely does. But I think, you know, more than anything, I kind of pointed to just like the experience of just being a Black um, man in America and sort of like how that has shaped my view on the world, you know, and, you know, there's the famous, you know, James Baldwin quote about to be Black in America, you know, it's like to be in a rage all the time. It's like, you have to have this consciousness and I messed this quote up. So please don't, please James Baldwin fans, don't come for me. He is a legend, but the point is that um, it's not, it's not possible to exist, you know, as a Black person in this country or just in the world in general without having this elevated sense of consciousness of, you know, how things affect you, how they affect your family, your community. So I think like that experience is paramount, you know, to um, shaping like what I do as far as like photography goes, you know? Um, So that's number one. I would say, you know, my education, you know, plays a role because I was always a big history, um, uh, big into history when I was in school, like middle school, high school. That was the one class that would keep my attention, like, you know, because I was just so intrigued by things that happen. And I think it just like speaks to my curious nature. Like I always need to know why things are the way that they are. And because of that, that also influences like the style and type of photography I do, because I want to create records, um, historical records that one day somebody could look at and be like, oh, this is what was going on in the year 
2020 when the world was on fire, like and look through my photos and sort of learn a little bit. So that's another, um, I would say, experience. And then um, another big one was that I grew up in the church, you know, when I was when I was a kid, um, participating in activities, the choir, um, youth fellowship, stuff like that. And I th- and I don't I didn't realize this back then, obviously, but now when I look back, it's like that was like my first real experience of like what a a community is like, a community that's like built on mutual aid. Um, people looking out for each other, just people like playing different roles to make things function and seeing, you know, the Black church in general is just like a very mystical place, but like seeing how all of that coalesces and how it comes together to like make something happen and to keep something going, you know, so that built in an early appreciation for me for community and like, you know, how people come together, you know, to get things done and, and take care of each other. Lovely. Wow. So definitely a wide range of experiences that, <laughs> which is amazing. Like, like I said, we are multifaceted. There's so many amazing sides of us. So thank you for that insight as well. Um, mm-hmm. I wanted to touch on something you said. Um, you said that you're curious as to like why things are what they are. Um, mm-hmm. I guess what is your approach to your photography in that sense? Do you find that a lot of the work that you do um, kind of takes a little longer to create or like, you know, you take your time with it. Like, how does that work? Um, Yeah, definitely. Like the work that means the most to me, at least is the stuff that I spend time with because when I need to do research, um, background research, you know, I need to look at what work was created about it in the past. Um, and then also I need to, I need time to build like relationships with my subjects because it's like the, the more, the stronger you build that bond of trust, like the deeper you can go with your image making. And I feel like people start to let you in on different aspects of their lives or after a while, they just kind of forget that you're even there like photographing them, you know, because they have opened themselves up and that takes time, which is not always, um, possible you know on everything but those like I said those are the sort of the projects that I would say like mean the most to me because the time and effort and energy put into it so it just varies depending on what it's you know what I'm what I'm actually shooting or what I'm actually photographing wonderful so I guess I want to touch on like the privacy aspects like I know sometimes like a lot of your work you know you document you know the community street um Mm -hmm. life and things like that so like how do you approach well I guess you kind of touched on it a little bit you said that you know you do your research so people are comfortable with you and things like that but I guess has it ever been an instance where privacy has been a concern or maybe a little challenging when taking photos and like how do you approach that oh man this is a a ever present like discussion and topic but you know and for me it's kind of like evolved as I have evolved as a as an image maker, um, because I really got my feet wet, you know, practicing street photography and everybody knows street photography is like, there's people that do it lots of different ways. Some people do portraits where they go up to people and stop them and take and ask them some like candids. I lean more towards the candids, but I have evolved a lot to like wanting to do more of the portraits because like, where I stop and ask people because I want to know more about subject whereas like the candidates they're slices of life and they can be really dope um but sometimes it's like I'm not satisfied because I'm like I don't know what anything about the people in these photos so like as like I said as I've evolved as a storyteller like I want to know more information to go with the photos to put in captions and things like that um but generally speaking I think it's a case-by-case basis like some photos don't call for like interrupting the moment and stopping and asking for permission um especially if you're taking a picture of like a street scene where it's like lots of people moving through you know number one in new york city is not illegal so there's no legal ground um for you to feel bad but i know sometimes morally you can feel bad so i try not to put myself in situations where i'm taking um photos that i think would make me feel bad morally like of somebody that's like homeless or downtrodden like taking photos of them you know without permission um and in the past I've also taken a candid photo and then like went up to the person afterwards and like 
showed them, you know, and then got their info and just said like, hey, I took this photo. You're in it. It seems to, like if it features them, like, you know, you could see their face and it's like more like a, a closer up portrait. I would do that. So it's just different approaches based on the scenario. Um, but yeah, I always try to show people in like positive light. So like, I don't have that issue where I feel bad about stuff because I'm never really taking photos. That I feel like showing people doing negativity or, you know, showing people looking, looking bad or looking hurt. You know, I, I really try to focus on like, like I said, or like you said in the beginning, stories that heal. Like, so I try to focus on photos that I feel like will have some healing power, not something that's going to make somebody feel bad about themselves. I love that. And I think it's important that you're taking that approach because like you said, it, you know, you don't feel guilty about ask or going up to somebody and showing them because of the messaging that, you know, you're getting across. Um, mm -hmm. That's amazing. Um, so yeah, let's dive into a little bit more about the healing role of your photography. Like how, yeah, like what is healing about your photography in your opinion? Um, because to me, because it's honest and I, and I think that honesty um, has healing power, you know, it also has the power to hurt, you know, but I do think there's two sides to healing. Like there's not like, it's a process, number one, and it's a spectrum. So for some people, healing means that they got to go through pain to heal, right? Um, or you've suffered pain and you're trying to heal from that. So that's really the true definition. You know, so I really just think that, um, you know, capturing certain moments for that people can reflect on and see different things about themselves or about what was going on, you know, you know, in the world gives you that um, space, you know, to think deeper and to sort of like, and I think that's part of the healing process. So, you know, really, I, you know, I just, I just think it comes down to like people um, being able to look at something harder and look at something deeper than they would normally like if you just saw it with your eyes because you might just see something and be like oh that's crazy and then keep walking and don't really reflect on it so I just try to I think in a lot of my photos what I'm aiming for is for people to like stare at it and look deeper into it um, and try to figure out like why did he take this photo like what is it about what's going on and that you know to me is the catalyst for healing if it's if it's something in that photo for you wow i love that the space to think deeper i totally agree with that because just on my own like wellness journey i feel like wellness and healing has definitely been bigger you know themes within the past couple of years and i mm -hmm. think it's important well i've found personally for myself it's important for me to just sit with myself sit with things so i think that kind of correlates to what you said about you know people being able to reflect and just think and ask questions and things like that which can lead to unpacking things and ultimately healing mm -hmm. um, wow <laughs> and Seriously. i guess i want to do it on the flip side um like how if any has um photography helped you um with healing Oh man, it's helped a lot because I feel like it's given me number one, it's a new it was a tool that I never really took advantage of, even though I was always interested in it for a while. So it's given me like a new tool to use for different things. And then it um it gave me a new language to sort of express myself. And what really drew me closer to photography was like a period of my life where I was like, I went through an unemployment. Um, I had been laid off for the first time ever. And it was a short period, but like during that period, I devoted myself to really like learning everything, right? That I had learned in the past, but never really took serious. So I had to reteach myself. Um, and this was around 2017, you know? And so, yeah, it kind of helped me on my journey to try to figure out like, hey, what is it that I really want to do and contribute um, in a creative and artistic way, you know, because I never really had any art form that I gravitated to, like, or stuck with, you know, I did different things, we all like, you know, grow up, trying to draw, paint, all this stuff, right, but I never really took none of that serious until that moment in my life, so I feel like it was, like, helping me heal from, like, 
negative um, views that I had of myself, you know, and beginning to let, beginning to make me, to empower me and make me feel like, no, you actually can do something creative and impactful and, you know, and learn. And um, the camera is really like, it's like a, a roadmap for me, you know, sometimes like, as I, as I said, I do street photography a lot. And I, if I have my camera with me, it's like telling me to go certain directions, like walk down there, the light looks good over there, right? And then I'll discover something or I might stop and talk to somebody. And it's like just different things that I would never do like without the camera. And there's a saying also by a famous photographer, I forget who about how the camera teaches you how to see, like, it's taught me to look at things in a different way. So I think all of that um, contributes to healing because it's like just making me realize things about myself that I may have taken for granted or never really, you know, took serious, you know? I believe a lot of photographers can relate to that. Like, you know, just being exposed to things that they wouldn't have been exposed to. And again, back to the point about spending time with yourself, with your camera, um, yeah, you really learn a lot about yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so like, has there ever been a time where you were out on these um, ventures with your camera where you um, felt like extremely satisfied with something that you took? And like, can you describe like what that moment was like? Oh, yes, yes, yes. That happened, there's so many. Um... But one that I could think of was, and it's very similar to like what I just said about the camera being like a, a roadmap. Um, there was this gentleman, um, a houseless gentleman. He was living on the street in Brooklyn in Fulton. And I walked, I was with one of my friends. He's a photographer as well, named Chris. And we walked by like, walked by him one day or whatever. Didn't really think much of it. You know, I think he asked for some money or something. We may have gave him something. I don't remember, but maybe, no, we didn't. We didn't. But then we came back like two days later and we said, let's just walk down the street. You know, hopefully he's still there and he was there. So like, you know, we bought him some food, talked to him. Um, he started telling, you know, telling us his story. His name was Dollar Bill. I actually posted, like I posted it on my Instagram, you know, and when it happened. But, you know, from that interaction, like, to me, this was an impactful thing because we spent so much time talking to him and listening to him. And then it was like at the very end, before we was about to depart and go on our way, I was like, you know, we both said it. We was like, can we take some photos of you? So it's just different when you like, back to what I said earlier, when you could like spend time, like this was a quick moment in time. So it was not the exact same, but spend time talking to somebody where like the photo making itself is like, is in the back is in the back of your mind it's not even like you chasing that you want the photo but the photo to me was like a foot it was like a um an end note or so like a punctuation to this like amazing experience where we were able to learn about this person's story provide some mutual aid um and just be like a support for somebody who who knows maybe he, we never saw him again but he didn't know that we would never see each other again but just something to help him along his journey. And um, when those things happen, it's a reminder to me of the power of human connection. And photography is a connector for me. It connects me to people. Um, I'm very, I would say, kind of shy, introverted, but it forces me to talk to people that I wouldn't normally talk to or wouldn't think twice to talk to. So that's one of many of those type of like experiences. Yeah, I love that. Like you're pursuing the story and then the photograph is kind of like the medium in which that, you know, manifests. Has there been a moment that was, that maybe didn't come as easily when taking a photo? Maybe, I don't know, maybe it was like a personal conflict or, you know, just something that was just hard to capture. I got asked to shoot a wedding um, for two people that was friends of a friend. And it was cool because it was like, it was a surprise wedding. Like they told people that they was coming for like their um their engagement brunch. Wow. And then like midway through, they kind of like told them like, hey, we're actually gonna get married. So come over to the room next door. So re only reason I say it's challenging is because like, the, like I'm not a wedding photographer. So the pressure of like 
you know, making sure you don't miss none of the most important moments of this like thing and I'm by myself. So just having to really, really be attentive to everything and try to place myself in the right places, um, you know, that to me was very challenging, but it came out good. And I like was, I was shocked and I was proud of myself. It was a, it wasn't like a huge wedding. It was probably like 80 to a hundred people, but still, I just know like, this is their special day. And that's why I'm not a wedding photographer because <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, I don't know if I can handle that type of pressure every time. Like I like to take the, my, like my photography styles. I like to be free flowing and I like to just like try to capture what I think is like the moment like those those moments that I think tell the story but and I did that for that so it's like I could do something like that again but full scale like wedding photography I wouldn't see myself like going diving into that wow that is a lot of pressure wait so <laughs> did they surprise you too or you knew about the wedding no I knew about this oh, okay. I, was like, <laughs> I did I did crazy okay <laughs> <laughs> that would have been crazy but they definitely told me because you know I had to know the itinerary and what the rundown was okay cool I was like ooh, that, that would have been an extra layer <laughs> <laughs> that's cool though but I, like I think it's great like how you know you gave it a try because like you said like storytelling it can come in many forms mm -hmm. you know, love community whatever it may be um so yeah um speaking of wedding photography I know a lot of photographers they kind of you know, dip their toes in wedding photography because, you know, suppose you can get a lot of money from that, whatever. But with the work that you do, how do you usually make your money? Um, I feel like a lot of people maybe gravitate away from, you know, maybe more journalistic photography because it doesn't, you know, suppose mm -hmm. to as much. So like, you know, what are some ways that you make money or are you even concerned about making money with it? Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Um, Money is always good, but it was never like my motivator. Um, I'm not a full time, like, you know, professional photographer. Um, but I will say that, you know, I did, it, it did allow me to start like my own photography business, like, you know, where I do shoot events and, you know, portraits and things like that. And so that's cool, but it's not like something that, um, like every week I'm like booked up, you know, it's, it's here and there. And I appreciate when those opportunities come, you know, so that's like my, I guess, more commercial side. Um, and then in terms of like journalistic work, I've gotten like a few commissions, you know, and this was like during 2020, um, when like, I think, I think what was going on was like a lot of editors from publications was trying to reach out to people on the front lines documenting like the protest movement. And then they wanted, um, you know, black photographers, you know, they were trying to make a concerted effort. So I did get like a couple of things like published from that where they would commission me. But, you know, it's kind of like, it's difficult because I'm still learning like how to navigate the freelance sort of like landscape and journalism when it comes to like building relationships with editors, pitching and things of that nature you know I was I just finished um grad school my journalism program at Columbia University thank you thank okay. you so like you know I learned a lot you know during that time about like you know what makes a story appealing and how you will go about pitching that which would ultimately like determine like what you can get paid to do um so again like I said it's not like on the forefront of my mind but it is something that I do want to I want to start building up more um clientele in terms of like editors at, at publications and things like that yeah that totally makes sense like I do agree that you know money is always good but I don't think that's the thing that is an indicator of you know whether or not you're successful as a photographer it's like you know the impact mm -hmm. you make um the quality of your work and so forth you don't have to be I had this conversation with a lot of people like you don't necessarily have to be a full-time photographer in order to be a professional you know like a True. lot of photographers, you probably would never know, have like odd jobs or other things that they're passionate about, right? So um, yeah, I think the path you're on is great. And thank you for, you know, being transparent about that as well. Um, yeah, thank yeah. you. 
And so um, I did notice that you were recently a part of an exhibit with, um, what is it, Art Justice Cohort? Mm -hmm. Like, can you tell me more about your role in that? Oh, sure, sure. So the, the Art Justice Cohort was formed in 2020 by this woman named Ellen Jacob. She's a, um, she's a photographer and artist as well. And I think she found all of, like, found us through social media. Yeah, that's how she found me for sure. But she pretty much group, wanted to group together visual artists who all, all of their work kind of has social justice themes to it. And um, we did our first exhibition last summer um, or last fall, excuse me. And we just, doing our, we just launched our second one at um, Culture Lab, um, the Plaxo Gallery in Culture Lab, which is in Long Island City. And it's called Being Seen. And so, yeah, it's really just about, like I said, it's about everyone having social justice themes in their work. And it's a well-rounded group of individuals that I think we all kind of align on why, like what our mission is with like photography and visual art and why we, you know, go about it the way that we go about it. So thank you for highlighting that um, because the show actually just opened on um, this past weekend. Nice. So I definitely have to check that out. Yes, I am. It's, it is in New York, right? It's yeah, it's in, in Long Island City. Long Island City, okay, yeah. Yep, the Plaxo Gallery at Culture Lab, and I believe that they're open, their hours are Thursday and Friday from, it's weird, it's from like five to nine or something like that, and then on the weekends it's 12 to nine. Okay. So it's evening hours during Thursday and Friday, and then the weekends is kind of like afternoon and evening. Nice, nice, yeah, well, thank you. Are there any other exhibits um, or projects that you're currently a part of or working on? Um, yes. I mean, so I have my own uh, visual artist collective um, that I founded with two of my friends, Natia Jones and Shade Tasanya, and it's called Souls in Focus. So we're working on a, um, a, uh, a art exhibit that we're going to put up in public um, in partnership with the Department of Transportation. And it's gonna just be highlighting like people from our community um, that we think are doing fantastic work and deserve recognition. Um, and it's called When We See Us. So that's something that's gonna be coming out and I'll be, we'll be sharing more information through um, our accounts, you know, Instagram, Souls and Focus and through our website, soulsandfocus.com. So there's that. Um, and as far as like me individually, um, you know, I think I had told you a little bit about this project I started before, but I'll share again, like this was towards the end of last year. I started a project um, called Black Girl Joy, where I wanted to focus on highlighting, um, you know, self-care um, routines that Black women use to kind of like combat, or just to take care of themselves, right? Because I what sparked it was I read a study um, from the American Medical Association that was sent that it said that um, you know black girls between the age of sixteen and twenty four like between twenty thirteen and twenty nineteen suicide rates rose by fifty nine percent and it actually went down for white people the white people of the same age and gender so it just made me think like you know what are black women going through number one you know, and what are they doing? So I figured if I can talk to adult Black women and have them sort of like talk in a way that's like, how would you talk to your younger self like about the things that you've experienced in life and how you got through them? It could be something that, you know, young Black women could look at and be like, okay, that's a good example. Or that's like something I could start doing now because I think most of my friends um, that talk about self-care and self-love, like we really just got that language. Like, within the past like five, 10 years, right? And I don't remember even hearing those words when I was like a teenager. So mm -hmm. I think it's important to get them exposed so that they're not having to unlearn things and go through certain turmoils and, um, you know, have, you know, possibly like attempting suicide or anything like that. So that was sort of my impetus for that project. So I paused it because of school and because my life just got so crazy. <laughs> so I want to pick that back up as far as like interviewing um, Black women, like I said, talking about their self-care routine and visually showing what that looks like. Um, because I think the visual aid helps like to see for young women to possibly be like, oh, that's how that's done. That's possible. I can do that too. Like I can go get my nails done, but I never knew that that was self-care, Yeah. right? Um, so yeah, that's something I'm working on now. And then 
lastly, something that still in the ideation stage, but I want to put it out there because I think when I say things, it makes me, when you put things out there, it's like, it creates accountability. So there's a project that I um came up with, or it's not fully fleshed out, but it just came about because I was taking photos at a friend's um apartment. I was doing like a photo shoot and his uncle lived on the top floor of a brownstone in Bedside. And he has this like pristine living room that looks like it's straight out of the 60s. Like everything in there just looked vintage. And it just made me think of like black homes and black home ownership you know, especially in a place like Bedside, Brooklyn, where things change so rapidly, but like there are people out there that have maintained, they've held on, like somehow they've held on to their property, they've held on to even the aesthetic. So I want to find more stories like that. You know, it doesn't have to be like a whole home, it could be one room, or it could be certain items that people just keep because it keeps them going, you know, so I'm looking actually for more subjects for that. So you know, people that have like maybe vintage furniture, um, vintage items in their home, black people, especially like specifically, um, that I think like kind of tells that that will help me to tell that story of just like how we have held on to things that you know the world has tried to strip us of um, and tried to prevent us from progressing. So that's you know another thing that's in the sort of like in the works. Wow, that's a powerful analogy. Wow, I'm interested in learning more about. Thank you. That. Honestly, all of your projects, like the Black Girl Joy one really spoke to me as well. Um, I think, you know, you speaking with these um, Black women, I think that's, I'm assuming that's probably like a form of healing for them as well, too. And in addition, it's giving back to the younger generation at the same time, um, you know, kind of being an example for them. Mm -hmm. um, that's amazing. And I do remember you like told me about that before. So I'm glad that you're still working on it. And nothing yes, wrong. Yes. you know, it's taken a while. That's the beauty of having a personal project. Like you can literally take your time. It's, you know, you're not pressured and it's, you know, things mm -hmm. are going to, you know, be, I don't know, you're going to produce it in a way that's like true to you, you know, without all yeah. that stuff. So I love that. And um, that's like, honestly, that's the best, like, I get the best results when I, when I can work it that way. So mm -hmm. Yeah, you hit that nail on the head with that. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, those are all the like pressing questions that I have for you. Um, is there anything else you'd like um, for the people to know about Henry, maybe behind the camera, something that we don't know about? Um, by just looking at your work. <laughs> well, we kind of like, I guess this will be like a, a bookend because we kind of opened up talking about like my experiences and how that, you know, makes me do the type of photography I do and like in the future I want my work to kind of like really elevate to being able to share stories that are national like you know happening in black communities across the nation um and more specifically you know I want to always be focused on what is happening at the community level that's that where you that is uh how do I say this? What is what is being done at the community level to find solutions to a lot of the issues that are going on? Because my biggest issue with journalism, I think, is that the stories that people, that the publication and the outlets gravitate to, like, wanting to produce are all about the doom and gloom of, like, what's wrong and what's going, you know, what's going so solutions journalism is like an aspect that I'm really interested in and more specifically like community solutions, community driven solutions, because for the longest um, black people have been trying to alleviate our problems. And I think there's like misconceptions out there that we're like, we're cool with certain things and that's happening in our communities. We're cool with gun violence because we only care when people say like, we only want to protest when, um, the police kill somebody, right? But that's not true. There's groups out there that every time a, like a shooting happens in a community, they respond and they they activate and they do something to sort of like bring awareness to that. But people don't know, a lot widespread people don't know about that. So that's sort of like my aim and like where I really want to take my um, storytelling and stay to and really try to stick to that because I think 
it's very easy to kind of get caught up in the news cycle of like everything is wrong and we need to talk about this all day 24 7 and i don't i just don't operate like that like <laughs> so i just wanted to say that because um you know that's that's what's fueling me what's pushing me forward wow wow that's a lot it's solutions <laughs> also is something that i need i want to look into more but i do agree like the media mm -hmm. you know can largely influence you know what people think or the conclusions that people come up with um unfortunately a lot of people these days don't take the time to do their own research and things like that so um, yeah important, um for people like you to be doing the work that you're doing um i actually do have one more question for you so mm -hmm. outside of photography or it could be you know something to do with photography but like what are you proud of yourself for today like <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Thank you for asking that. That's really good. Um, well, I alluded to it earlier. I just graduated um, from journalism school and I'm proud, obviously, because I graduated like, you know, that's the easy thing. But for me, I was more proud because like my story with journalism was very interesting. Like I studied it in undergrad and, you know, I just had like a moment where I was like, this is not for me. Like there's nobody that looks like me hardly in any of my classes or the professors. So I don't feel, I feel out of place and I really let that stop me from going after something that I was interested in and it was a life lesson so when I got the opportunity to kind of like to go back and attend and finish I was like wow like I never knew when I made that decision back then that I would be doing this now so it came full circle I was just like no like you know if you want something you can't let nobody stop you from doing it and Nobody, you can't let make it let anybody make you feel like you don't belong somewhere. So it was like that type of life lesson, and it was for me. It wasn't for anybody else. Like I didn't do it because I had to, or because I felt I need to get a degree or anything like that. It was just like no, I made the decision to do it for myself, and so that was a that's a very proud moment. I'm still like, still like going through the stages of like, wow, did that really just happen? Like it was like three weeks ago. So still celebrating, still, um, you know, trying to give myself my flowers, you know? So yeah, that's what I would say. Wow, that was an amazing way to end. Like, honestly, I don't need to say anything else. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, that really spoke to me, wow. Um, well, there we have it. Thank you so much, Henry, for joining us on the Open Frame Podcast. I am just so grateful for this conversation and excited to see what's next. Thank you for having me and I'm grateful as well.